Okay, my name is uh, Dr. Frank Sabatino. Uh, I'm happy to share this information with uh, my vegan path, vegan lifestyle. Uh, it's interesting for me, I go back to my teenage years uh, really wanting to be a physician early on in my life. And I was going on a standard path. I was in a pre-med program at the City University of New York. And I met a man who was an insurance salesman in the Bronx who had collected an anti-medical file for about 20, uh, library for about 20, 30 years. And it was all of the uh, hygienic uh, masters, doctors, all of these thinkers on alternative health care and well-being. Because he knew I was in a pre-med program, whenever I went over, he was the father of a, a friend of mine in school. He took it on himself to attack me at every turn. I began to read my way through his library, and it was the first time I read about all of these hygienic pioneers like Dr. Herbert Shelton and so on, which are the foundation of this National Health Association. That really changed my life because at that point I realized that I didn't really want to get involved with drugs and surgery. And they were talking about kind of a whole plant food diet. They were talking about the biological requirements of life and how we generate health by the choices we make and the lifestyle choices that we commit to. It really revolutionized my way of thinking. I started to publish a paper with Louis, and he was Uncle Luigi, he was an Italian insurance salesman, and he had been involved in a personal correspondence himself with Dr. Herbert Shelton, who ran the, one of the original fasting institutions in the history of the United States in San Antonio, Texas. Interestingly enough, when we wrote this paper called Social Commentary, A Challenge to Think, Dr. Shelton published some of my articles as a teenager. And that was like a big feather in my cap, this big granddaddy of the hygiene movement, looking favorably on the things that I wrote and so on. And that's when I decided that I was not gonna go in the direction of medicine. I thought chiropractic would be a better path because it was drugless. I can be involved with counseling people, working with people, teaching about lifestyle, but I didn't have to get involved in drugs and surgery. So from that point going forward, I decided to go to chiropractic college. In chiropractic college, I met many of the hygienic pioneers that ran fasting institutions. I started a hygiene club at the chiropractic college. I met these doctors. Some of them I went to their fasting centers, and I decided that I wanted to go in that direction, get involved in doing therapeutic clinical fasting, chiropractic care, nutritional counseling, all of that. So when I finished chiropractic uh, college, I wound up going to do an apprenticeship with Dr. David Scott who ran a fasting institution for 40 plus years in Strongsville, Ohio, right outside of Cleveland. And that's where I got um, my experience really in kind of an apprenticeship in fasting care. And then I ran my own place, a place called the Shangri-La Natural Hygiene Institute, which in the late 1970s was on Bonita Springs, the west coast of Florida. And it was really one of the premier fasting centers in the United States at that time. We had 110 people a week and we could have as many as 40 to 50 people fasting a week. I was 27, 28 years old, it was my first gig, and it was kind of like trial by fire because I dealt with very serious pathology. I wanted to learn more, do more, so really to shorten the story, when I left there, uh, I opened my own place with a partner for a short while, and I decided I wanted to do more research. So I went back to teach in the chiropractic college in Atlanta, Georgia called Life College, and I went and got a uh, fellowship and studied at the Emory University School of Medicine where I got my PhD in cell biology and neuroendocrinology where I spent five years doing hardcore high-end brain research for all those years. And that's what led me when I left that to get that kind of uh, postdoc position on the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Texas in San Antonio that pioneered that work in calorie restriction and aging. And that really laid the groundwork for things like intermittent fasting and things of that nature, understanding those mechanisms. And so that kind of prepared me to, with the skills that I wanted to eventually bring back into this vegan world and into this chiropractic world to use those skills to push that database, that evidence base forward. I wound up then going into running a place called the Regency Health Spa in South Florida for 25 years which really was where we did all whole food plant nutrition, therapeutic fasting. That brings me into then operating a few places on my own right up until present time. But I've been involved with that hygienic model and that National Health Association going back 45 plus years and bringing this into my personal practice. And I raised a family of five children that way. So uh, I myself have been on that vegan path probably close to 45 years. And I like to say I've been doing it like some of the old pioneers when it wasn't cool, like the old country song, when it wasn't cool. 
Uh, things have been catching up with that now, lifestyle medicine, you see a lot of medical people, physicians and so on that are now embracing this way of living and thinking. But I go back to a time when there weren't a lot of people doing that and now they're catching up and I'm happy about it. It's kind of spreading out. But this idea of plant exclusive nutrition is an old, it's an old story and it's getting more heyday of popularity, but it's a very, very powerful tool for health and well-being. Let me get this straight. 45 years ago, when was that about? Yeah, we're talking about 70s, early to mid 70s, when you think about it. Late 70s would be, let's say, somewhere between mid to late 1970s. No, no fish, no meat, eggs or dairy. No, nothing. no, no. I wasn't, I wasn't completely what we call SOS free like I am now, which means no salt, oil and sugar. Because back then we had some of that. We didn't kind of know it as well. But uh, yeah, pretty much far back as, as, as that. And really, the la I tell people, it's funny when I think about it, the last like red meat of any kind I had was like 1971. When you think about it, it's 50 years now. I mean, I, you know, I look at that, it's kind of like, whoa. And maybe after that, there might have still been a little bit of cheese that crept in or whatever. But then that was kind of all kind of abandoned by the middle to later 70s. Incredible, man. So is there any reason anybody at all ever needs to eat any of these meat eggs? Short dairy. answer, no, no. And, 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 and I say that with a lot of gravitas because, you know, we're all brought up to think that if you don't have those kinds of products, there's going to be certain deficiencies of certain things. And the truth of the matter is there's nothing in plant food and maybe with the exception of things like B12, which we sometimes talk about, that could be lower in vegan diets than they will be in meat eating diets or animal based diets. But there's so much of a problem with all of the, the other items that are in that animal based approach, whether everything from saturated fat to animal proteins and fats that are going to drive insulin resistance and diabetes to heme iron, concentrated forms of iron, exaggerated levels of amino acids like methionine that we now know increase the risk of certain kinds of cancer. We're going to see things like uh, glycated products because we cook these foods under such high heat and pressure. So the refined processed food, the animal based foods, they really have no place in the human diet and there's no reason to eat them under any circumstance. So for me, uh, you asked the question, why did I get into this? Part of it is was dietary. I had a, my own health history early on with kind of a colitis in my ch childhood to teenage years that really was resolved. You know, in growing up in New York, I was taken to some of the best experts for this, this kind of bowel related issue that I had as a child. And none of those experts ever even addressed the idea of diet. I, in fact, I still find it interesting today that many gastroenterologists, people that focus on the bowel, they still don't see any real relationship between what you're eating and bowel function which is kind of pretty bizarre when you think about it. Anyway, no one really addressed it. And it wasn't until Uncle Luigi, my mentor, turned me on to this uh, whole hygienic way that I started sampling that eating plan and all the bowel related issues became a thing of the past. And I thought it was remarkable after 20 years of medical mismanagement that it took an insurance salesman from the Bronx to solve the problem of colitis, which is kind of intriguing. So the bottom line is no. To answer your question, there really is no reason to eat those foods. And more than that, if we continue to try to eat those foods because of the factory farming and the impact on land, the earth and animals, we will not be sustainable on the earth. So there are reasons that go way beyond personal health to make this transition. They go into the impact of those choices on all the species of animals around us and on the planet itself. So that's very important to me. All of that's important to me. That is awesome. Now you raised your kids this way too. I did. Early on in their lives, uh, their mother was brought up in a Seventh-day Adventist family, which have a history of that, but they used some dairy. So early on, they did have a little bit of dairy in their diet. They were all nursed and breastfed for very long periods of time. Um, so then eventually that was pulled out of their diet, but they were raised certainly uh, if you will, kind of like a little bit of lacto-vegetarian at that point, and then really gone into a vegan way. But they were all nursed extensively. The Adventist studies have shown that the vegans have better health outcomes, but pescatarians maybe live a little longer. What's up with that? These data get skewed because a number of the studies that even come through the Epic Oxford study in England, the Adventists, when you put them all together, I would say that that's probably untrue. I think the vegans that are really committing to more plant-based, 
will have a little extension of lifespan, but the truth of the matter is the quality of life is so dramatically improved. And that's an important piece because I think we live in a, in, in a culture where even the medical model suggests that if we can just get people to last longer, we're somehow accomplishing something, they're not really living longer. So if I can get you and you're still taking a few steps and gasping for breath and you're living a few more years, what's really the point of that? The real key is what's that functional quality of life that you're maintaining, that you're maximizing by embracing this way of eating. And there's no question that from recovery, from performance, from reducing disease risk, the plant-based vegan approach is the way to go without any question. And I think most of the studies, whether it's Adventist, the Suchi, whether it's Epic Oxford, and many of the studies around the world support that. What is the most interesting thing you've discovered when you look across all this different research? There's so many magical things about body function. You know, even the fact that when the sun hits your skin, it converts cholesterol in your skin to vitamin D that allows bones to hold on to calcium and build strong, dense bone. I mean, if you even just think about simple processes like that, it's a remarkable thing. I gave the talk on genetics. To me, that's some of the most profound stuff, how eating plant exclusive provides nutrients that will literally change and, and, and modify the DNA architecture so that now it's reducing cancer risk and, and changing the way proteins are produced to modify hormones. And so these things are all really incredibly magical when you think about it. I mean, we've got anywhere from 10 to 50 trillion cells that are operating every second of every day, doing dynamic function, regulating every imaginable function of absorption, nutrient uh, waste removal, all of this dance of life that's going on is so overwhelming. I made the point yesterday uh, in, a, in a talk that if you look at the amount of even genetic material, DNA in a cell, our cells have enough DNA material that if you strung it out end to end, it would go around the circle of the earth 40,000 times in one human body. Think about that. And we're holding on to six feet of DNA to program all this protein function, six feet of DNA in a cell that's one sixth the width of a single strand of hair. So, I mean, these things are really mind blowing. I mean, truth. What happens when we fast? What are the different stages? You know, after 16 hours, maybe you go into a little bit of ketosis. To simplify, if you think about this, we need blood sugar. Blood sugar is kind of like the substance of life. So when we eat plants, the glucose that's in, or fructose in those plants, those carbohydrates, in the presence of the oxygen that we breathe, are converted in the energy factories of the cell called mitochondria into all the packets of energy that we need to do everything that we do. So sugar is fundamental to, to really energy production and life, and that's why we're meant to eat plants. In fact, there's only two options on planet Earth. You either eat plants directly or you eat the body of an animal that ate plants. Because one way or another, you've got to eat those plants, right? You've got to get that material. Now, when you fast, you know, the body, and the body has a way to make sure, to ensure that you're always keeping a certain amount of sugar in that bloodstream to support all the cells and especially very glucose or sugar dependent cells like the brain and your blood cells. The brain is only 2% of your body weight. It takes 20% of your energy. So you, we got to have that sugar circulating around in there. So the bottom line now, you're going to decide to fast. You're going to stop eating. Well, now nothing's going in to replenish your blood sugar. But we have sugar stored, for example, in the liver, like a savings account that the body will pull out in the first day or two of fasting. But that's only for the first 24 to 36 hours. So after that, now you're stuck with a situation. You don't have blood sugar being replenished by food. You don't have storage forms of sugar any longer available in the liver. So now the body has to convert other things into energy producing material, into glucose. And it does that by a process called gluco, glucose, neo, new, and like the first book of the Bible, Genesis. So it converts protein and fat into a usable source of energy. In the early days of fasting, the first one to two or two, two days or so, it's going to do that a lot with protein stores. But after that second, going into third day plus, it shifts away from that protein use and starts really leaning on body fat as an energy source. You know, most people don't realize that when you're eating carbohydrates and proteins, they provide four calories of energy per gram. But fat provides two and a quarter times that, nine calories per gram. 
So fat as storage is a remarkable storage form of energy. So in the fast, you start breaking down that fat into something we call ketogenesis. You're generating energy from your fat stores. And that becomes a primary energy source even through very extensively long periods of fasting. And in that process of ketogenesis, now the body is feeding the body. It's, it's feeding itself. It's literally eating itself in the fast. And because you don't have nutrients coming in to promote growth and all of that because you don't have it, there's enzymes that are kicked in in the cells that begin the process of house cleaning. They really go into detoxification and getting rid of old worn out proteins, old parts of the cells. They rejuvenate and clean those cells as a maintenance and house cleaning. And that process is called autophagy. And that's autophagy, like self-eating, but really what it means is that there are little vesicles, like called autophagosomes, that will engulf all the debris in a cell, all the garbage. And they'll take old proteins, bacteria, viruses, broken down organelles, little organs of the cell, and they will take from it what it can use while it eliminates the rest. And under that process, the body will take what it needs least and feed what it needs most. So what do we need most? Well, heart and liver and kidney. What do we need least? Tumors, cysts. So it'll start to break down tumors. It'll break down cysts. Now, at what point, where are we in this time? Well, we're into that period anywhere from day three, four on. And so it starts, keeps doing that consistently. As the body is deprived of those nutrients, you're stepping up that process of autophagy. And I liken it to imagine if you had a corner of a room with old, worn out debris, nails, rusty wood. And from that, you could build the Taj Mahal. So the body is renovating itself through this process of autophagy in the fasting state. And nothing does that like the fasting process. So fasting is a major detoxification tool. It's a major renovation tool. It reduces inflammatory change. It activates stem cells that cause new growth or new revitalization of the immune system, things of this nature. But we recommend fasting as the complete abstinence of everything but water in a complete resting state. Because the idea is we want to harbor the energy that we save by not appropriating food and resting for the work that the body sees fit to do. And we have to understand that the body has a wisdom. It knows what it needs to do. It knows what it doesn't need to do. We're trying to give it the extra energy to do what it needs to do. And so fasting is a profound process, but it needs to be monitored. It needs to be regulated under resting conditions. And then the way you feed after a fast is very profound because you have to do that slowly but surely. And sometimes people make mistakes by trying to eat too much. They can have uh, problems with feeding syndromes post fasting. But we tend to want to do three things when we fast. We do a pretty careful medical exam. We do a screening exam, you know, we screen the people and then we will do blood work because we want to make sure that that person is really a good candidate for fasting and they don't have some underlying change that may contraindicate uh, their benefit on the fasting process. Now, can an everyday, regular, healthy person that's eating whole plant foods do some intermittent fasting and still get some of that autophagy Yeah, or you don't quite you don't quite get it the same, but we do recommend, especially for people that are really trying to lose weight, that they probably eat within about an eight hour window of time. So they're kind of not eating about 16 hours and it gets them more in touch with what I like to call the light dark cycle. And then if you're not eating a few hours before bed and then in the morning before you eat, you do some nice vigorous activity. All of that will burn up fat and sugar reserves a little bit. It'll promote some of the changes somewhat similar to fasting, not the profound autophagy, but some things like that to some degree. But it's a way to really help people get back in touch with the light dark cycle. Because truthfully, we're not really meant to eat a lot when it gets dark and move a lot. We're supposed to be preparing for bedtime. So if you're eating more in that window of light and then you're preparing for rest and sleep at night, you're getting activity in the first thing in that morning when you wake up, you're getting back into a natural rhythm that's really good for the body. Now, when I try to do these 
intermittent fast. I, I like to have a little coffee in the morning. Is that okay? <laughs> Before I break my fast. I That's not going to break it, is it? I don't recommend doing that on an empty stomach because now you're getting the acidity of coffee. You, I think the first thing to do almost would be better off would be to do just kind of a simple walk or some kind of simple activity and then go into having something probably more fruit and vegetable like. And then if you were going to have some coffee with that, I guess you could. But I don't, I don't condone coffee drinking. I know there are many doctors that do. Um, I find that what happens with stimulants like caffeine is they cause rebound effects of depression. Remember, anything that goes up has to come down. And generally speaking, a lot of times we're trying to get that motor running in the morning with that first cup of coffee. And look, it's, it's hard. It, it will cause remarkable elevations in sugar, which can cause reactive crashes. There's changes that can go on by that kind of caffeine consumption. So it's almost better to get a little bit of activity. Or if you really need something, maybe a very light little piece of fruit initially when you wake up because it's easy to digest. And then go out, do a little bit of activity, and then get on with your day. But I think working on that intermittent fast is a good way to go. So a little, little light fruit, that doesn't break it necessarily? No, it breaks it. I mean, it okay. is going to break it. But, but again, if you needed something, that would be the easiest thing to do. Right. Is there anything besides water that might be okay that wouldn't necessarily break it? No. Okay, wow. Not really, because the body has to use digestive uh, enzymes, digestive energy to handle just about anything. I mean, you can make the case that maybe uh, an herbal tea of some kind may be able to be used that way without caffeine. But my feeling is, you know, once you get into the pattern of this, you get really used to that idea of being a little physically active first thing in the morning and then having something to eat after that. And frankly, you get to that point where not eating 14 or 16 hours is not, even, is not a big deal. But that really is gonna be a little bit better for people trying to lose weight. And interestingly, new research has suggested that it's not just the intermittent fast that's beneficial, it tends to be a little bit of the fact that when people do that, they do end up restricting calories a little bit more. So the calorie restriction becomes a little bit a part of that. How does a child that's being raised on a whole food plant-based diet maybe differ? What we sometimes see is that the growth rate may be a little slower because we're meant to grow a little bit slower. And frankly, when you look at the milk of any animal in nature, it really has evolved for the purpose of providing nutrients that suit the growth rate of that animal. So for example, if you look at a cow, it grows to full maturity between, let's say, one and three years where we grow to full maturity over 15 to 20. But if you're putting something like a cow's milk into a human infant or meat products, you can actually foster a premature growth and development. So that young girl may menstruate significantly earlier than probably is in her best interest. Or little Johnny may grow you know, to such a size with hormones at a much earlier age that then kind of compromise them as they get older. They may lay the groundwork for premature cancers, for example, of the breast in young girls. There were some studies in the past that women who menstruated before the age of 13 could have a significant greater risk of breast cancer as adult women. Little Johnny's not supposed to be 6'2 and 200 pounds at 10 years old. He's not supposed to look like he plays linebacker for some professional football team. He's supposed to grow slower over time. So with vegans, we kind of see that in children a little bit more. Uh, some of the things that they will absorb a little bit better, you know, certain minerals and nutrients, they will. Uh, there is a suggestion that some, min some nutrients may be a little lower in vegan children. And so sometimes by making sure that you ensure the diet is more diverse with leafy greens and whole grains and all of these kinds of things. And I raised uh, children, have been around a lot of vegan children, and if they're eating a very diverse plant-based approach, and then you're making sure that they have adequate things like, you know, zinc and B12 in the diet, usually you're okay. They do really well with growth. They do really well with help. And most importantly, they have much less of all the childhood diseases and problems that kids that are eating conventionally do. So they don't have the colds and the flus. They don't have a lot of that breakdown. For example, I raised five children that never had a pediatrician visit. Now, if you look at what happens average in America and the number of doctor visits they have, in the United States, many children, very commonly by the time of 18, can have anywhere from 10 to 15 rounds of antibiotics. I raised five children, didn't have one. What was different about them? They were raised vegan and vegetarian. So it makes a huge impact on health impact. It makes a huge impact on how much other stuff 
and diseases they generate, typically less allergies, less asthma, less respiratory stuff. They recover from colds and flus much more significantly and dramatically. They typically are laying the groundwork for less health problems as adults. Sometimes the growth rate may reflect a little bit slower, but again, that's a lot genetically determined. And so they'll achieve whatever their growth is going to be, but just probably a little slower over time. Again, when you look at studies across the world, uh, really very intensive studies, a lot of those arguments become, they become more moot. They're, they're not quite as clear cut as some of these people make it. And oftentimes they'll pick a study that reinforces the point they want to make and they'll highlight that study rather than looking at the panorama of studies. So that's a problem. So what's your favorite thing to talk about? Oh, for me, I like to talk about so many things because I'm, I'm into music, I'm into art, I'm into everything. When you ask me what's my favorite thing to talk about in health? Yeah. Well, when, when we're talking about health, my favorite thing is talking about what brings out human potential the best. You know, what makes people be the best that they can be. My feeling is it's a lot about performance. That's why you see a lot of athletes going into this way of eating because they know they recover faster, they perform better. But if for my life, the fact that I embrace this allows me to perform and function at such a high level at the stage of life where I am without any injury, without any health issues, without any doctor pharmaceuticals and doctor visits and being able athletically, intellectually perform at such a high level. So for me, it's about what's that quality of life? What's that health span? What's going to get you that incredible performance at all ages and stages of life? So for me, I like to talk about that game changing aspect of living and eating this way. And it's not just about food, because we gotta talk and address the other biological requirements. And that includes, of course, rest and sleep. Physical exercise is critical. Uh, stress management approaches. I've been a student of uh, Tai Chi and Qigong as martial arts for, for decades. And so they're a big part of my whole practice for that sense of inner awareness of my body and also flexibility and balance and the integrity of my whole mind, body, and spirit. All of those things are important to me. So for a long time, I would talk a lot about things that weren't just about food in this world because I think too often people lose sight of you know, the fact that there's other features. But I will say that if there was one thing that is important for the impact on the planet itself, it's going to be the food choices at this point. And that's gonna be something that we have to address and deal with. Yeah, the reason why I asked you that is because over the past couple of days of hearing you talk and getting to know you just very briefly here and there, it seems like you have such a vast amount of knowledge on different topics. And, and you even went into psychology during one conversation. And I think you said you have a, a degree in that. I got a, a counseling certificate in addictionology, for example, because to me, we know that in the world, the whole addiction and compulsive behavior thing is a big piece for human beings. I mean, when you look at this lifestyle, it's really very basic. We're talking about eating better, moving more, sleeping better, handling stress. I think it's common sense. So it's not rocket science. The question is, why don't people do it? So that's the motivational part. That's the piece where you're overcoming your own addictions, where you're overcoming your own compulsive behaviors or having to deal with those in a way to make choices that are in your best interest. And what happens is when those patterns and habits have been established, they will influence and compromise sometimes your ability to make those constructive choices because you're getting voices in your head, so to speak, that are directing you in a lot of areas that are not in your best interest. So part of growth and consciousness is how do I get myself, how do I get to that place where I'm really clearly seeing the consequences of my choices in a way that I can make choices that create the outcome that I would really love to achieve in my own performance, in my own health, in my own well-being. And to me, that's what I like to talk about because just talking about eating well is great, but people know that's important, but why can't you do it? Or what's blocking you from doing it? What is the thing that's in your way from really achieving maximum human potential and well-being? That's a very important conversation for me. So I have a lot of these videos and people comment and they say, oh, there's so many vegan failures out there. And I think anytime somebody's trying to change any behavior, there's a, there's a high likelihood there's gonna be a relapse or some sort of failure in the process of uh, toward success, right? What's going on there with, with some of these failures, uh, look, transitional I, I, my, difficulties? My problem with that question is this, that 
If you look at the panorama of people in all walks of life, what you can say is there are successes and there are failures. That's just the nature of the human condition. I think sometimes people want to try to highlight a vegan failure because somehow that's their fulfilling prophecy. They want to make some point that it doesn't work. And maybe that's coming from a place where they couldn't make it work in their life for one reason or another. So they have to justify the fact, well, it doesn't work. I've seen as much success, I've seen certain failures, and the bottom line is, if someone's not succeeding at something, well, you've got to get to the bottom of how they're applying themselves to that. How did they try to do it? What were the steps and ways that they tried to incorporate those choices? Where did they fail? What were the problems that came up? You know, so what were the things that got in the way of your success? So my personal feeling is, yeah, there are people that will say, well, I tried eating vegan, didn't work for me. I don't even know what that means. I mean, I've been doing this a long time and I've seen so much success. And then I see people that, you know, they want to go back into eating some meat material. Look, sometimes some of those, pro some of those eating habits, some of those eating patterns will provide some stimulation, whether it's meat, dairy, whatever. They may provide some, like, for example, we know there are morphine-like compounds in, in dairy. So you'll get an opiate-like effect eating cheese, you know, like a little bit of a well-being effect sometimes, but it's an opiate-like effect. Or you may get a stimulation from the uric acid in meat that's similar to caffeine. So what happens is when people make changes, there are things that are going to surface. Like if you think about our lives, that things are layered into us on a physical, emotional, and maybe even spiritual level. So as you make energy available and you go along your path and now you're improving how you eat and you're informing the body with better food and lifestyle habits, that body's going to start working its way through those layers of your past and your history. And it's going to start bringing things to the surface. And some of that can be really uncomfortable. Physically, it can be uncomfortable emotionally. We see that in fasting. There can be pain. There can be discharge. When I first changed my life into this, I was doing drug abuse. I was doing a whole range of different things. And I went through several years of various symptoms hitting the fan at times where every one of those steps I could have said, oh, this isn't working, man. This just ain't working. When the fact is it was working to the max. And here's one of the problems. We have all been brought up to fear our own vitality. One of the things that comes out of hygienic thinking and living is that many of the symptoms of diseases are the actual action of recovery. They're the way the body tries to promote a remedy for you. We call that remedial action, the remedy of action. And so what happens is if you give the body energy and you rest it and you've got some toxicity that it has to deal with, it will now start to move that out. Well, you may have a symptom, you may have a rash, you may have a headache, you may feel like ugh, you may be staggering around for a little bit, but that's actually part of that recovery process. But we've been brought up to see those actions as diseases that need to be medicated out of existence. I got a headache, what do I got to I'll take an aspirin. Can't have a headache. You got a joint, oh, got to put some, got to take an anti-inflammatory. When what may be happening is that's remedial action that the body is using to heal yourself. So initially I tell people you need to embrace and love those symptoms as foreign as the thought that is to you. And the bottom line is if you can roll with that process, you can go through that layer of change that happens when you start making positive changes in your life and the body begins major healing. And this is a big piece. And I think sometimes the failure is that it's coming from fear. It's coming from this idea, well, this just isn't working. But the fact is it may be working to an incredible degree, but you're really separating and disengaging from the wisdom and power of your own body. That's a very important piece, I think. It's good stuff. Now, do you have any success stories that you'd like to share that were really... Oh my God, so many through the years. My own life was a success story. I told you, I grew up with ulcerative colitis type symptoms for many years of my life. And it was uh, not until I did some fasting in my own life where I saw a tremendous and dramatic change. Through the years of working with people, you know, we've seen everything from rheumatoid arthritis resolve. We've seen tumors in the body resorb. We've seen people get into levels of performance and change that are mind blowing. People that are staggering around, overweight with diabetes, heart disease and the like, in short periods of time resolving that. And it's quite amazing that you can take diseases and pathologies that may have taken years to develop and by applying the body 
or applying these principles and choices to your lifestyle see such remarkable change in very short periods of time. It's almost as if there's a biological forgiveness etched into the actual genetic machinery of the body. And so what I urge people is, you know, I'd say, look at that, look at that wisdom, look at who you really are. Look at the masterpiece that you are. Even when you have discomfort, even when you have pain, understand the role of that in this dance of life and embrace it, but move forward with it. And if you're trying to create a goal, create those choices or set those choices in play that create the consequences that you want. If you want to be healthy and more functional and thinner and livelier and more beautiful, are the choices you're making creating that consequence? And if they are, bless you, I applaud you. If they're not, guess what? You gotta put the big boy pants on because it's time for you to make that change because no one can do that for you. That's built choice by choice, moment by moment, and that's the mindfulness and consciousness of true health and healing. Understanding the power you have, understanding how the body exerts that power to rectify and heal itself, and how you and I can get on board with embracing that power and loving who you are in the process to allow it to unfold. That's really important. What are some suggestions or recommendations you have when approaching people with these ideas? Because the people, they come back with a lot of resistance. In all the years of counseling people, I have yet to find anybody who loves deprivation. If I tell you not to do something, there's a part of your brain that almost can't wait to do it and do it in my face. So if you're gonna to try to help people make a transition my advice is you gotta do it somewhat slowly and you gotta give them some options and substitutions initially. And so while many of these substitution products in the vegan world are not clean, some of them are very processed, they do allow someone who wants a burger to now have a different kind of burger that's not, that's not meat based. Or they may have alternative milks or desserts. So sometimes bringing those things in allows the person feel like they're not being deprived. And the likelihood is they may embrace some change a little bit easier. If I go home and start emptying the cabinets and throwing everything out of the house and your family's going to gather around and want to commit you to the nearest institution, you know what I'm saying? And fight you every step of the way. But by finding some legitimate substitutions, easing into that process of change, oftentimes you may be able to influence someone to at least start the process of change. And then if they can get to that point where they start feeling better or maybe losing some weight and performing better and more functional and sleeping better, it starts to motivate them to move on with that process. But you gotta be patient. Look, there's one thing that, influ that is the best. You can't save anybody, but you can love anyone. And so my best advice is love them, give them the leeway to make whatever change they need to and the time factor to do it because everybody needs that. One thing, I struggle with is this this idea of meatless Mondays because I don't feel like it's enough time for somebody to experience the physiological changes that they're they, you know that going maybe three months right you know like and so they so they think oh I tried it and all they did was try one day well if if it's going to be a one day thing that triggers some ongoing shift then maybe there's value in that like we just talked about sometimes you got to ease in and maybe you take a couple of days a week where you're not eating any animal products at all and you see how that feels and you see if you can work with that. But the bottom line is, I agree with you, if it's going to be a one-time thing, it's not enough because they're going to need a period of time to really feel the benefits and the differences and certainly in terms of weight loss and health outcome and so on. So look, I think it's a beginning. I think it's a way to look at you know, some change that can occur, but we need much more dramatic change than that right now. When you look at the impact on the environment and things going on around us, there's a recent study came out of Bonn, Germany, that suggests that we need to cut animal product consumption by about 75% right now in the world for the earth to really sustain us over time. And that's a big, that's not meatless Monday anymore. That's like really making a move. So there comes a point now where we're getting closer to that point where we can't kind of, you know, fool around with it. We've got to make bigger commitment to change. And look, there are things changing all over. I travel to different parts of the world. It's amazing to me how we're seeing so many more vegan options and plant exclusive options in different countries, different restaurants. So the consciousness of it is definitely expanding more and more. We see more physicians now in lifestyle medicine recommending plant exclusive approaches for dealing with heart disease and major diseases. So things are shifting. The question is, will they shift enough for us to really engender a healthier earth and healthier outcome for the entire population.
So I guess there's some sort of balance there. Okay, don't don't push them too hard, but at the same time, they gotta go. Push. Don't push <laughs> yeah, them too hard. Don't push them too hard, but push. But you know what? You, you're gonna do a lot more, like I said, with a little bit of loving kindness and how you do it, but also making things and turning them onto things like they're similar to what they're used to. And once they taste it and have an option and see that, wow, this is really something that maybe I can do. Because I think at first people think it's absolutely impossible. It's too difficult, oh, too expensive. That's always the argument, too expensive, too difficult. It's really not. If you think about what the cost of rice and beans are, not a whole lot of money. So the bottom line is that's, that, can be a major, that can be a major meal with a few greens, a little veggies, you know, a little salad, and you got a meal. It's not expensive and it's not difficult to cook. But now there are so many resources on YouTube and online with food prep and so this is a perfect time now because there are even so many uh, special community interest groups on Facebook and Instagram where they're sharing recipes and they're sharing all of these things and there's summits on health and well-being. You just got to open up to it and then allow yourself to learn from people that have been doing it for a long period of time. You know what's wild to me is when I'm dealing with these anti-vegans online and stuff, and I look at their channels, despite being like the 90 plus percent of the population, right. they, they don't showcase this very well. They don't showcase any sort of support for this opposing view at all. We've got Nutrition Facts, PCRM, we've got even Kaiser and you got And you've got huge, major population studies in most many countries of the world that reinforce the fact that the vegan, the vegan approach reduces the risk of all major chronic degenerative diseases while promoting quality of life and good growth and, and health across the board. So the data is very, very strong. And the proof is in the pudding. Just look at the people doing it. You know, the bottom line is, it's like unbelievable. Look, I'm gonna be 72 this year. I'm race walking the same way I did 20 years ago. I have the same body fat from back then. Haven't seen a doctor in over 60 years. Haven't taken a pharmaceutical at all. In, since probably the age of uh, 15 or 20. The bottom line is I'm not unique. I mean, I'm unique in a sense, but I'm not unique in the fact that that's very common for people that really embrace this way of living and eating. And I'll tell people the proof is in the pudding. You know, you put someone, just look around the population and look at many people who are in their early 70s that are eating conventionally. They're on, they're, they're on walkers, they got heart disease, they got this, that, and the other thing. They're spending most of their lives going from one doctor to another. Yeah, but then they go keto and then, you know, oh, oh this person did so great on keto. Look, we, the, no one is designed to eat a diet that's 65 to 95% fat. Nobody, nobody on planet Earth and certainly not animal fat and animal protein because you're dealing with heme iron, you're dealing with high methionine, you're dealing with high arachidonic acid promoting inflammation, you're dealing with acidosis, you're dealing with so many things by doing that. And frankly, no animal on the planet needs to be slaughtered and mutilated for somebody's dietary or energy outcome. No one on planet Earth, no animal, on, no beast on this planet. So the bottom line is, you know, you've got to really think in a much bigger way, in a bigger picture, and understand that we are an animal that is designed to live primarily on fruits, vegetables, and plant-exclusive plant material. And when we do, and we move away from animal and processed foods, we just do better. That's who we are. We're human primates, and that's who we are. Yeah. There's things also like, the, I think the Institute of Medicine makes a pretty clear case for eating plant-based, you know, with the acceptable macronutrient distribution ranges being higher in carbs and saying, decrease saturated fat and increase fiber all of that that's what i'm saying the nutritional content of the vegan or plant exclusive diet is more than adequate to sustain the highest quality of life and you're doing it in a way with the highest fiber content with adequate protein good positive quality fats in whole food form not isolated in bottles of oil you're getting very low sodium, you're getting really high quality nutrients, what else do you need? And all the macros are provided beautifully. Just look at the vegan bodybuilders that are out there. I mean, you've got, you've got high performance athletes now, endurance runners and so on. And then even people like me getting into the 60s, 70s and 80s who are performing at unbelievable levels. And I mean on every level, I mean physically, I mean exercise wise, I mean sexually. You know, we talk, you see these commercials. In the United States, after the age of 40, half of the men in America have erectile dysfunction. That is ungodly, that is unconscionable, should never be. And that has a lot to do with blood vessels in that genital region being congested, being blocked. 
You know, erectile dysfunction is heart disease of the penis and genital. That's what it is. And when you're eating this way, you're performing in your 60s and 70s sexually like you did in your 20s and 30s. So it's remarkable. You know, this is the thing. It is about performance, and people need to know that. It's not just, oh, I'm just going to eat vegan because, you know, it's really about quality of life and health span and performance and vitality. And while doing that, embracing the highest moral values of humanity, empathy, compassion, and love. That's what we're about. And that's love in action. So this dietary approach is love in action. It's not relying on violence. It's not relying on devastation. It's not relying on damaging the earth, its resources, and all the animals that live on it. It's about love in action, compassionately, passionately, empathetically, really, really taking into account the fact that our choices are not limited by the boundaries of our own skin and the borders of our own kitchens, but they have consequence and impact on everything that goes on around us. And we need to consciously really embrace that. Some people I know have had some stomach discomfort, maybe a little bloatedness, a little gassiness, whatever, maybe a little diarrhea even. <laughs> and, it, it, and maybe it's just something to do with their, the routine they're having. Because you understand, if you're coming from a place where you're eating compromised food, low in fiber, that's processed, you're, when you start eating this diet, it's like a stick up in there. The, the body's all of a sudden like, whoa. But even some of these people say they've been vegan for years and still, you know? Usually there's an adaptation. The way to do that is, again, introduce foods with lectin content like beans and things a little more slowly. So you're eating smaller amounts, chewing it more thoroughly, not drinking a lot with mealtime, just allowing the body to adjust to the diet a little bit more. But there is an adjustment when you come from a very fragmented, processed eating plan into a really high quality fibrous diet and the bottom line is you want things maybe a little more steamed than cooked you know you want a little less raw and you're building in raw foods and and so those kinds of things you can make those adjustments and over time they'll adapt there's an adaptation i think also maybe it goes back to this fasting thing or at least intermittent fasting not eating late Getting that night day window, you called it, yeah. dark, dark light, is that what it was? Yeah, we called yeah. it the dark light cycle, but really like eating within an eight hour window or so. Because you're trying to sleep and you're bloated. And you well, just if ate. you're eating a lot close to bedtime, for example, yeah. the chance for reflux is greater, the chance for bloating is greater. Mm -hmm. And again, if you're eating heavy, if you think about it, and snacking. because night is a time for winding down, we're really, really meant to eat lighter later. If you really want to get into it, probably having a bigger meal midday would probably be more in line with how we're better functionally you know, addressing eating. But we don't do that. We typically eat big dinners at night, you know, and so on and so forth. So sometimes just adjusting that a little bit can be a way to really improve the quality of that whole digestive system. But I will tell you it has quite a bit to do sometimes with just adjusting to the high fiber nature of the foods and then having them in a little bit more of a steam form and, and eating more slowly, smaller quantities of certain, and then just building on that. Yeah, yeah. What are some of your favorite foods to eat? Oh, me, I love it all. You know, I, I like right now we're in su summer. So for me, you know, the fruits that are out now, like in Florida too, you got mango and you got organic peaches and plums and, and all of these kinds. So I love fresh fruit. And I know there's people that argue about eating a lot of fruit, but we're fruit eaters by nature to a great extent. I love broccoli, steamed, I love broccoli. I love simple grain and legume dishes. You give me brown, you, you give me brown or wild rice with some lentil or bean and a big salad and some steamed veggies like broccoli and kale, I'm in heaven. And you know, sometimes we'll put a little nut sauce on it where you may blend a little bit of cashew with a little water or lemon and that, and that can be put on your greens and, and you know, uh, usually a little vitamin C on your food, uh, on your greens will absorb, you know, uh, mineral content a little bit better, like iron content, for example. So you put lemon, you can squeeze it or make a nut sauce to have a little bit of lemon juice in it, that kind of thing. So I, I, my diet, I like really simple things because my taste is so open and sensitive to the really simple taste of foods. So give me a big salad, I'm ecstatic. Give me fresh fruit, I'm ecstatic. Give me a little bit of brown rice or quinoa with some lovely lentils, beans, I'm, I'm in heaven. So those things are easy. The supplements that you recommend, maybe. I think, I think many of the vegan docs and looking at nutrition, the discussion has come up 
where you know many of the things are available in the diet. I think where things have come up is that there has been compromise, for example, in things sometimes like B12. So many nutritionists and even the doctors that do plant exclusive counseling will recommend probably a B12 supplementation. Now you can measure these things in blood tests to really accurately decide if you need it. But if we're doing it on, in a general sense, probably the idea of B12, vitamin D comes up sometimes because people are not getting a lot of sunshine. Vitamin D, when it hits the, the cholesterol in your skin, converts that into vitamin D3, which goes into the liver, it gets processed from there into the kidney, and that vitamin D is, is, goes into the body. That's something I recommend measuring on most blood tests. And we like to see on the blood test anywhere from 30 to 100 nanograms per milliliter. And I like to see it around mid-range. Many people would recommend rec uh, on, a, on a routine basis probably consuming about 1,000 to 2,000 international units a day. But again, depending on your need, I think that's a better way to look at it. Sometimes they're concerned about lower zinc content in the diet because it's a little higher in dairy products and things of that nature, though it does exist in different plants. So sometimes they're looking at, you know, involving a little higher zinc content that can happen. Uh, sometimes iodine content can seem to be a little bit lower unless people are eating iodized salt. We're not recommending salt, but they can get it in things like dulse powder or kelp powder to get a little additional iodine. Iodine is critical for cognitive function, energy, and of course, it's a foundation for thyroid hormone production. So a lot of hypothyroidism can relate to low iodine levels. So I would say B12, D3, iodine, and then there's always that discussion of omega-3 fatty acids, which are coming from things like chia seed, hemp seed, flax seed, walnuts. They're in greens, but you have to eat huge quantities. Alpha-linolenic acid that's in those foods gets converted through a pathway into EPA and then DHA. And of course, sometimes there's a question of how much that pathway is really uh, going and how much it's really fostering. So sometimes people will recommend the end point of that pathway like DHA, which can be done in algae because it's really found in fish, but it's also found in what fish eat to make fish, which is algae. But because it moves in a linear pathway from ALA, linolenic acid, to EPA to DHA, having the precursors like EPA or steridonic acid, like you find in things like ahi flour, or possibly even just eating larger amounts of flaxseed, chia seed, walnuts, things of that nature, will be enough. You can do measurements to look at that fatty acid profile, but I think there are some um, vegan people who want to supplement that. So they may do an ahi flower supplement or they may take an algae supplement of DHA. I don't like that as much because it can feed back and interfere with the body's natural production of DHA. But I think those are the four kind of basic things people will tend to look at. B12, D3, zinc, and probably the omega-3 fatty acids. And again, uh, in a supplemental way, having some of that, I think may afford some background protection for people. Now, you can get DHA chlorella maybe, or also seaweed. Yeah, not quite to the concentration that people feel you need. So it's higher in concentration in algal forms because it's concentrated in that way. But for, make, for going from ALA to the longer chain oh, a polyunsaturated fatty acids like EPA and DHA, you're not going to get those in food quite as much unless you're eating those other foods. But the conversion usually happens well in the body, except there are times when those conversion enzymes are compromised and you're not going to convert EPA to DHA as well. And that, in that case, you're going to need to take some form of DHA, and that probably is best in algal form, not fish form. They can figure that out through the index test. Well, some things you can do an omega index test, but again, you're measuring that in the blood. You don't know necessarily what the tissue stores are, but the bottom line is that is a test that can be done. That is one way to look at it. Uh, so that can be done. But most people don't necessarily do that. They just do kind of what I call a little protect your butt nutrition and just tell people just to take it. Just take it, you know. But now if they just take it, there could be a problem, right? Well, we don't know. That, that's the problem. You don't know. Now, generally speaking, I don't think most people will feel it's a big problem. But I, you know, with my training, there's something in the body called negative feedback inhibition. If you have any pathway in the body and you take the end point of that pathway, or you, whether it's a hormone, an enzyme, whatever, the body will kind of stop making its own of that. And I get concerned over time that that can affect the actual natural pathway in the system, that's all.
we're not supposed to supplement calcium. We know that. But but sometimes people say, well, it's hard to get. And maybe it's really not. I when mean, the, the RDAs, though. No, but even when you're looking at the broad base of things like the, the greens that are consumed, almonds, some of the nuts, even the calcium-fortified nut milks that people use, there's a lot of ways to get calcium into the system. And truthfully, lower amounts of calcium are going to be more utilizable in the body when you're not pulling it out of the system by acid forming elements like dairy products, meat products, refined sugar. So you'll hold on to more because it's not only the calcium you take in that's important, it's the calcium you keep in and absorb that's important. That's what's important. Do you have a quote you like to share? Do I have a quote? God, many quotes. I like the quote by Thomas Henry Huxley, one of my favorites, he's a biologist. And he said, each individual moral progress, meaning each progress we make individually, and how we embrace these higher moral components of empathy, compassion, love. Each individual moral progress is a social progress, society at large, and it's an ethical advancement in the history of civilization. It's a very cool quote that has always stuck with me. And it tells you that each of us makes a difference. Because I think too often we feel that we don't. What's one person gonna do? Even my son's, ah, what's one person? So I eat dairy, well, you know, it's one person, who cares? Each individual moral progress is a social progress, an ethical advancement in the history of civilization. You think we'll ever see a vegan world? I don't know if the world will live long enough for that. That would be lovely. I keep seeking that light. I keep pushing toward that light. We live in some dark times right now, and I know there's a lot of pressure and a lot of up and down. But the truth is, that is light at the end of the tunnel, and it's light that we need now. So I'm, I just keep pushing. How can people find out more about you? There's a drfranksabatino.com website. I have programs like I have a whole vegan-based uh, Lean for Life weight loss program, the Science of Effective Weight Loss. It really is, is the most comprehensive program on healthy weight regulation because it covers all the features of addiction and sleep and exercise and all of that. I am now the new current uh, director of health education for the National Health Association. So healthscience.org is a wonderful organization. I urge people to join that, get their magazine. They're not selling any product. It's only intellectual information to change your life. I, I write for them. They're an amazing organization. And then take advantage of all the vegan organizations, whether it's PCRM, uh, whatever it may be. And take advantage of all these incredible vegan entrepreneurs and people doing, sharing recipes and sharing information. So uh, I have those websites. I'm available through that. And um, I just urge people to keep trucking, and keep pushing, and keep trying to adopt more and more of this into their lives. Can people see you speaking at certain events that maybe you could share with us that we could look forward to maybe attending? Yeah, well, you know, I, I always come annually to the conference of the National Health Association, the NHA. Uh, and so that's really dear to my heart and a big passion for me because I've been with them for almost 50 years, so to speak. But I'm on different summits now and I'll, you know, right now I'll get invitations to go speak here and there and I'll go on the road to do that. But as a rule, a lot of where I can be seen are probably in different kinds of YouTube and online talks and things that have been shared. But a lot of it can go through healthscience.org. In fact, I'm starting a podcast for them. Well, I will be interviewing myself. I'll be the moderator myself in dialogue with some of the luminaries in the field all physicians, environmentalists, people that are really trying to do real passionate quality work. So you can look out for that on healthscience.org and that website. And I'm also doing position papers for them. So there's something they call health insights. I'm writing all of those for them. A little small papers on different subjects. So that's what's coming up in the near future now. You also mentioned you like music and stuff. Do you play any I'm instruments? a musician, yeah. I, actually, to me, music was a big part of my life. So I've played in blues bands through the years. My son, I got two sons that are incredible musicians. In fact, one of the bedrooms in our house is a recording studio. Oh. So, yeah, yeah, so we got that going on all the time. Look, I like poetry, music, art. You, you can see how I am. I, I just am excited about many things in life. And from the early stages, I loved film work. If I didn't do what I'm doing now, I would have been a filmmaker. That's how much film and, and all of that had an impact on me. So I'm a kind of a film buff, music lover, all of that. And I think, look, Embracing as much of that beauty of life is really what life's about, experiencing it all. And I urge people to get out there and do that. Find the passion, find something like that, find an avocation, find a hobby like that, 
that really turns you on. That can be a big part of health too. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you so much.